today. You may remember how um, a few weeks ago we celebrated Pentecost, which is when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that first day of Pentecost. We now live in the age of the Spirit. And we called that Sunday, Life Begins. But I suppose that then begs the question, well, if life has begun, how do we live out this new life in Christ, this new life in the Spirit? And, you know, sometimes people can think, well, Miles, if I become a Christian, does that mean somehow I have to be a little bit weird and stand out? Uh, I saw a a friend tweeted uh, yesterday uh, of uh, a picture of this um, girl's birthday party. And for her birthday party, she um, said she wanted a, a fancy dress party. So picture this. It's a girl's birthday party. It's fancy dress. What do most girls like to come dressed up as? Princesses, right? Elsa, etc. They want to come dressed as a princess. So sure enough, um, all the girls turned up dressed uh, as princesses, apart from one girl who came (laughs) as a hot dog. (laughs) Don't you just love it? If you want to rock that in a hot dog, go for it, is what I say. But I think sometimes we think coming to Christ will be a little bit like that, that we have to somehow stand out and be weird. Well, the good news is Jesus does not want you to be a hot dog in a world of princesses. (laughs) Dan, don't tweet that. It makes me sound very theologically unsound. (laughs) Jesus doesn't want you to be a hot dog in a world of princesses. We don't have to be weird. In fact, what happens when we encounter Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit is the Spirit makes you more the real you. He makes me more the real me. So how do we live this new life in the Spirit? Well, we find the answer partly in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we're starting a series today going through this letter, and we're calling this series, This is Living. Now, uh, the church there in Philippi, a very, very interesting place. Uh, Philippi as a city, it's in uh, what is today uh, northeastern Greece, and uh, it was founded and named after Philip II of Macedon who was Alexander the Great's father. And it had grown up originally around the gold and silver mines there, but they were now uh, long exhausted. But it had a colorful history. The assassins of Julius Caesar, you may remember, Brutus and Cassius, were famously actually uh, captured and defeated in Philippi by Mark Antony. And it remained a highly strategic city. Why? Because of geographically where it was, the city of Philippi is in the gap between two mountain ranges that separate Asia from Europe. So the main trade route between the two great continents passed through the city. And in one sense, every Christian finds themselves, we find ourselves in a strategic place. Where the Lord has placed you is not by accident. You may like where he's placed you, or you may not like where he's placed you, but you're not there by accident. You're strategically placed to be good news in that place, to be light in darkness, to love others. And this uh, city was important because Philippi was the location where St. Paul had planted the first ever church plant in Europe in AD 52. And he's writing this letter to them 12 years after he started the church. And Paul is now 1,300 kilometers away in Rome. And he writes them this letter. And this letter is full of joy. In fact, Paul uses the word joy 16 times in the letter. And it's full of encouragement. 
He's not correcting any doctrinal error. He's not addressing any local crisis. He's just full of encouragement to live out this new life in the spirit. You may have heard me say a few weeks ago how uh, Nihal came on the last Alpha weekend away, the Holy Spirit weekend away. Uh, and he was burdened when he came because uh, the, the very uh, next, the, the first day after the weekend, the Monday um, morning, he was booked to go into hospital um, to have a stent put in his heart because one of his uh, arteries was al almost completely blocked. Uh, he was prayed for on the Holy Spirit weekend away. Then on the Monday, went into the hospital, and the doctors were amazed when they checked his heart because miraculously, the uh, blockage had so reduced that they said, you don't need a stent at all. Now, not every single one of us, when we come to Christ, will, like Nihal, get a new heart, literally. <laughs> but we do get a new heart spiritually and emotionally. And in answer to this question, how should we live in Christ? Paul begins this letter to the Philippians by talking about the new heart that we can have. So let's begin by watching our first reading. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here we see in these amazing opening words of this letter that Paul encourages the believers in Philippi to have a heart of confidence. He says in verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. The church in Philippi was established by the most amazing, powerful work of God. It actually all began uh, in frustration in AD 49. Paul had been desperately trying to get into Asia. And every time he tried, he'd been prevented from going in. But then God sent him a vision of a Macedonian man, a Greek man, calling Paul to come and minister to Macedonia, modern day Greece. So Paul responds, he takes his companion Silas with him, and they go to Philippi. The first thing they did there in the city, by the way, we know all of this because it's recorded in Acts chapter 16. And the first thing he did was he went down to the river there, where there was a group of Jewish women, and he preaches the good news about Jesus to them. And the first convert, the first person to respond is Lydia. She's a wealthy Jewish woman a trader in purple cloth, and she invites Paul and Silas back to her home, where all of her family accept the Lord, and Paul baptizes them. The first convert, a wealthy Jewish woman. The second convert in Philippi was a Greek slave girl. 
She uh, was a fortune teller. Why? Because she was filled with evil spirits that enabled her to tell the fortune of people. And her masters used this to make lots of money. When Paul and Silas are walking around the city, the slave girl sees them and starts following them and starts speaking out over and over again. These are servants of the Most High God. These are servants of the Most High God. After a while, you can imagine, that gets a little bit annoying. So by about the second day, Paul's had enough. He's going, I wish you would just be quiet. So he turns around and he commands the spirits in, in, in this girl. He says, in the name of Jesus, get out. So of course, they have to flee at the power of the name of Jesus. And this young girl is delivered. She is set free. She's the second convert. A wealthy Jewish woman, a Greek slave girl. Now, her masters are not happy about this. Because, wow, this young woman might be set free, but she can't make them money anymore. She's lost her fortune-telling abilities. So they sort of stir up trouble with the authorities in the city. So they arrest Paul and Silas and put them in prison there in Philippi. They chain them and put them in a cell. And what do Paul and Silas do now they're prisoners? They start to worship. They start singing and praising God loudly. And God responds by shaking the jail, literally, like an earthquake. And at that point, Every cell door flies open and the chains fall off all the prisoners. In the jail is a middle-class Roman jailer. And when he sees what's happening with all the doors flying open, he thinks, all the prisoners are going to run out and I'm going to face the consequences, which is worse than death. It'll be torture and then execution. So he draws his sword and he's about to fall on his own sword. When Paul shouts out, don't do that, we're all still here, we're just having a, a, a praise party, you don't need to worry, and the jailer's amazed. What do you mean you're still? So he invites Paul and Silas back to his house, where Paul shares the good news about Jesus, and the jailer and all of his family come to Christ, and Paul baptizes the lot of them. This was how the church began, amazing. And if you think about it, wealthy Jewish woman, Greek slave girl, middle class Roman, there in the church was an eclectic cross-section, a microcosm of the ancient world. Such was the display of God's power that Paul remained confident that what God started, he could therefore complete. And if God begins a good work in you, or me, which he has, he will bring it to completion. And we need to retain this confidence, even when the going gets tough, or even when we're afraid. Because it's not to be a confidence in a what, but it's to be a confidence in a who, in the person of Jesus. A few uh, years ago, the uh, Anglican uh, church in Nigeria, and the Anglican church, by the way, is huge in Nigeria. There are about 75 million Anglicans in Nigeria. And the archbishop there decided that he was going to hold the first ever Anglican conference in Africa, in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. So he thought, who would be good to have as the main speaker? Ah, Reverend Nicky Gumbel, the pioneer of Alpha, who was my boss in London before we came here. So he wrote to Nicky, inviting him to speak. Now, as you can imagine, Nicky's kind of a busy guy. And although he wanted to go, he'd already said yes to another engage, speaking engagement. So being a man of his word, he didn't want to let down somebody that he'd already said yes to. So he said, he wrote back to the Archbishop, Nicholas Oko, saying, thank you so much for your kind invitation. I would uh, love to have come, um, but unfortunately I can't because of a prior engagement. But if you would like, you could have my associate vicar 
to, go, to speak at your conference, Reverend Miles Tillman. Now, Nikki didn't tell me this, but when he did, I remained relaxed because, I mean, who is Miles Tillman? They're never going to say yes to that. They wrote back saying, oh, that would be wonderful. So I got increasingly nervous about going to speak there, and they, they then sent me the title I was to speak on. I didn't even understand it. I had to speak on the church and the divine commonwealth. So I thought, what am I going to speak on? And so I, I wrote something rambling, and the time came, I flew to Abuja. I got there, and I walked into the huge conference center, and my heart sank. Because there were 12,000 African priests and me. <laughs> I thought, what am I going to do? What's more, the stage was right in the center of the conference center, and the 12,000 chairs were around the stage. And after the welcome, I was first on. I was getting more and more terrified. You could say I was anything but confident. And I was sitting by the side of the stage with bishops and archbishops next to me. Uh, the uh, bishop of uh, Rwanda turned to me and said, are you nervous? You're looking a little pale. <laughs> I said, no, I, I'm just a white man. <laughs> he found that very, very funny. But the truth was, I was terrified. <laughs> so with great fanfare, they announced me, and up onto the stage I went. And I thought, it's fine, I'll just take the mic, and I'll, I'll walk around the stage as I preach to address the 12,000. Well, I, no sooner had I put my book on the lectern that I heard a sound and felt a judder. <laughs> and then this happened. <laughs> the stage started to rotate. <laughs> if I was a little nervous to begin with, I was now terrified. <laughs> and I began spluttering, tripping over my words. Five minutes in, it was not going well, I can tell you. I was not connecting with the listeners, I uh, was feeling, if I'm really honest with you, completely seasick from going round and round. <laughs> and, so, and my confidence was gone. So I did what every speaker does when they uh, are in that position. I thought, how can I get out of this? Maybe I could feign heat stroke and fall over. But actually, I thought, okay, I, uh, I'm just going to pray. And I, I, obviously not out loud, because I was speaking at the time. But I said, Lord, I can't do this. My confidence has gone. And do you know, I, I really sort of hear God speak really clearly to me. But right then I did. And he said to me, Miles, you're not meant to be confident in yourself, but be confident in me. Very important lesson I learned that time. Oh dear, what have I done? Here we go. Now, whatever you are facing in life right now, you can be confident in Jesus that he will bring you through it. He will bring to completion the work that he's begun in you. And our ultimate confidence, of course, is in Christ and his promise to us of having eternal life. This is why a few verses later in verse 21, Paul says, uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Nothing can take away from you that gift of eternal life. You can bet your house on that. You know where you are going. Your destiny, your future is secure eternally. So Paul Right, saying you can have this new heart of confidence. Then he says to also to them, you can have a heart of compassion. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, 
all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And that gives us a new capacity to love. And Paul is writing this letter, as I said, 1,300 kilometers away in Rome, but he's under house arrest as he's writing this letter. And it's extraordinary that this letter is so full of joy because Paul is sitting there, falsely accused, awaiting trial, facing possible execution. And what's more, as he writes this, he's literally in chains. Three foot of chain attaching him to a Roman guard. And this is no ordinary Roman guards. These are the imperial guards, the palace guards, 16,000 of them, the most elite troops in the empire. They were paid a better wage. They were given a fat salary when they retired. It was the best of the best. And they were on a rota every day. A new one would come and be chained to Paul, three feet of chain. And yet Paul, he doesn't moan about this. He's just full of joy and love for his jailers, as it were, such that he loved these Roman soldiers with the love of Jesus, talked to them about Jesus in such a way that by verse 13 it says, the whole palace guard were talking about Paul and about Jesus. I wonder, is there someone that God is asking you to love. Maybe someone who's not easy to love. Maybe someone who has hurt you in the past. Maybe someone who you feel puts chains on you. Well, you can ask Jesus to help you love them. Think of Paul and Silas when the chains fall off and the prison doors open, Paul didn't go, right, now time to get revenge back on that jailer. No, he loved him and said, let me tell you about Jesus. There's a pastor called Paul Nagrut in Romania. And during the communist era there, the Ceausescu regime, a repressive communist regime, uh, pastors were seen as enemies of the state. And Paul Negret, Negret, simply for being a pastor, was imprisoned, put in a concentration camp for six months, and then he was brutally, physically tortured every day for six months. Uh, A number of years later, after communism had collapsed there, uh, an old woman contacted Paul Negret and said, would you please come and um, pray for my son in the local hospital. He's on death's door. He's dying of cancer. So Paul Negrut went to the hospital, and when he walked into the room, to his shock, he saw that this woman's son was the camp guard who had tortured him physically every day for six months. What was he going to do? And Paul Negrut says at that point, God, by his spirit, gave him this supernatural love for this man, for his torturer, such that he was able to lay his hands on him and pray for healing in the name of Jesus. And this man was miraculously healed. He got better. He was discharged from hospital. And from that point on, Every week, without fail, this man and Paul Negret would meet together and pray together. That is only the love of God. We can't, in our own strength, conjure up that sort of love. Paul says they can have a heart of confidence and a heart of of compassion. 
And thirdly, he says in these opening lines of the letter that the Philippians can have a heart of continuing growth. Verse 9, and this is my prayer, he says, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It had been 12 years since Paul began the church there. And the church in Philippi had grown both numerically and in maturity. The two are often linked. And now Paul prays that they would continue to develop. He prays for growth in love. He says that their love may abound more and more. And love for God, and as I said, love for others are linked. But he also prays that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best. Love is not meant to just be an emotional experience. No, it's meant to give us wisdom, a depth of insight. So we need to spend time in prayer with God. We need to spend time listening to him primarily through the Bible, his word. And we need to spend time together discerning God's will for us. This is why connect groups are so important. They meet on Tuesday nights across the city. I encourage you. Get into a connect group so you can connect with one another and connect with God and grow in maturity and knowledge and depth of insight in love. And it's amazing what happens when we're filled with this love that our insight can be enlightened. A friend of mine was a pastor in a city in England called Bath and he said he had a man come to Christ, come to faith, who was a plumber. The man was very practical with his hands, but had never been any good at school, had no qualifications, but was a good plumber. But when he became a Christian and was filled with the Spirit, it was like a switch was flicked in his brain. And this man suddenly, like never before, had a hunger to learn, to read. He began reading the Bible. Then he began reading commentaries on the Bible. Then he began reading theologians. This guy went on and did uh, a certificate, then a diploma, then a degree, and then he got a PhD in the Swiss theologian Karl Barth. That's not normal for a plumber. But the Lord enlightens our mind that we might have depth of insight. But he also prays that they would grow not just in love and insight, but he prays for their growth in holiness. Verse 10, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul wrote this letter in Koine Greek, uh, which is sort of common Greek, which was the lingua franca of of the day. If you wrote anything in the ancient world, you, you wrote it in Uh, Greek, it was like a a legacy left over from uh, the Greek Empire, which was the big empire before the Roman Empire. And the Greek word there for pure that Paul uses means unmixed. And he's describing an inner purity where even our motives are pure. But then he uses the word blameless. And the word he uses for blameless there means without giving offense. In other words, it's describing your outer way of life, your outer actions. So Paul is praying that the Philippians would be holy both inwardly and outwardly. Now the good news is that because of Jesus and his saving death on the cross for you and for me that we can have forgiveness of sins, a fresh start. The good news is right now, God is looking at you and me and he sees you as pure, blameless, 
and righteous. You might think, well, you don't know what I thought or said or did this morning. doesn't matter. The cross is enough. Your status is a given. God looks at you and he's saying, You're, you, you are holy. You are righteous. Thank you, Uncle Timkey. But the Spirit can then come and empower us to live a life that is in line with our righteous status. Not out of obligation or out of law, but why wouldn't we want to live a life in line with our righteousness in Christ? But we need the Spirit so that we can outwardly live a life that reflects the inward righteous status that we have standing before God in Christ Jesus. This is amazing. This is what Paul is praying for. And the Holy Spirit helps our lifestyle to come in line with our righteousness. And it sets us free. This is living. Uh, A few years back, before I got ordained, I worked in an office. And one of the guys I worked with was a salesman called Steve. And over the months, I started chatting to Steve about... Jesus and uh, the good news, and then we uh, decided that we'd start meeting together. At the end of um, the day, um, we just grabbed a spare meeting room in the office. I'd take my Bible, we'd chat, I'd read a few verses to Steve, we'd talk about it, and then I'd pray for him. And we started to do this for a while, And then after about maybe four or five months of doing this, Steve said, oh, uh, my wife wants to see you, Miles. I thought, oh no, what have I done? And he said, no, no, it's okay. She she just wants to ask you a few questions. So I met his wife, went around to his house, and she said, I want to know, what are you talking about and praying about with my husband? I said, oh, is there a problem? She said, no, quite the reverse. She said, he's changed. I said, how's he changed? She said, well, it's like he's been set free from something. I said, really? What has he been set free from? She said, well, this might sound a little bit weird, but I think you've set him free from drinking milk. (laughs) What? And you could see Steve looking slightly embarrassed there. And she said, well... You see, Steve, when he grew up, he really loved his mother. They were really, really close. And the last thing the mum did every evening before saying goodnight to her son was she'd give him a glass of milk. And she said, well, about two years ago, when his mother tragically died, she said it was weird. Every morning I'd wake up, And I'd go down to the kitchen to make a cup of tea or coffee to give the children some cereal. And I'd find that all I had left in the fridge were empty bottles of milk. I knew they were full when I went to bed. And we couldn't work it out. She said, until one night I saw Steve. He was sleepwalking. Every night he'd get out of bed in his sleep, walk to the kitchen, open the fridge, take out all the milk, drink all of the milk, put the empty bottles back in the fridge, and then go back to bed. Every single night, he would clear the fridge of milk. She said, but here's the thing. From the minute you started praying for him, after doing this every night for two years, he stopped doing it. She said, it's revolutionized my life. (laughs) I now have milk in the morning. (laughs) She said, it's like you've Something's been broken in him. She said, what is this? I mean, talk about an open door for the gospel. I said, it's Jesus. She said, does he do that to everybody? I said, well, it might not be milk. (laughs) But he can set everyone free. Would you like that? She said, yes, I would. This is living.